Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me again. This is the Pittston Library's reading of A Christmas Carol for those of you who are just tuning in with us. Um, if you didn't get a chance to watch our first video and you want to pause this video right now, no worries. We're going to be here for you um, when you finish watching that first video. If not, you can um, soldier on through with us. We're going to recap what happened in our last chapter. So just to kind of give a general, you know, let's go back to the beginning. We have our main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, and he is a very nasty kind of unfeeling sort of fellow. And he was visited by his friend, Jacob Marley, who died seven years this very Christmas. And he's telling Ebenezer, dude, if you do not shape up, you're going to end up just like me and you're going to be dragging all of your chains, which are way worse than mine because you've been such a baddie um, for the whole rest of your afterlife. And it's going to be every bit of money you could have given away, everything, it's it's going to be locked into those, those uh, money boxes. And so Ebenezer Scrooge does not believe him. He totally thinks he's indigestion, which doesn't really make that much sense. But there's a small part of him that wonders if that is in fact true. So he goes to bed kind of hoping it was all a nightmare, and he is met by our first ghost, the ghost of Christmas past. And what I find interesting about past here, if you can kind of, let me bring it back here, interesting because past kind of has this look here like a child, but our book describes past a little bit differently, kind of um, as an old person, as a young person, not really male, not really female, but just kind of an embodiment of kind of everything that's happened, almost like a like a wisp, if you will. And past here is holding out a um, a little like candle. I don't know if you've ever seen one like it, kind of like it's a, a stopper. It puts out the candles because past is like a little bit of a light, if you will. So you can't really. Um, run away from the past. You can't squash it out. So Scrooge tries to do that, but you know, past has a couple of things that um, they need to um, bring up with Scrooge, and that's like kind of just to revisit all those Christmases from the past. And he's had a few doozies. He, you know, was having trouble with his family, and he spent all his time at boarding school, and he was a loner. He didn't have any friends, it seemed. And Christmas was always like just a terrible time. So past showed him a little glimpse of, you know, how things ha did improve and he got to um, spend a Christmas with his sister. And we, the readers, find out that Scrooge wasn't always so grouchy, that he had a sister that he loved, but unfortunately she passed away. And um, that kind of really took a toll on him and kind of probably contributed to his nasty demeanor a little bit. Maybe he kind of pushed down a lot of a lot of his feelings and things, which, you know, some of us tend to do. So Scrooge, um, you know, we learn about his sister and then we learn about one of his former employers, um, Fezziwig, who threw this banging party and Scrooge had an awesome time and it wasn't that the party was, you know, anything like out of um, any uh, like a rich party or anything like that, but just the fact that Fezziwig took the time to be kind to his employees and to his neighbors and, and all that kind of thing. And just, you know, how like those little gestures just really matter in building character and, and um, all of that stuff. So we learn about that bit with Scrooge. And then finally, we learn that he did fall in love one time which you look at this guy and you're like, oh, this guy, fine love, come on. But he almost got married. And we learn from the story that, um, you know, he, his grouchy ways and everything allowed his engagement to be broken up because Belle, his former fiance, was like, you obviously care more about your money and your finances and, and all that than uh, about me and about, you know, our future together because... He's only looking at the money. So Scrooge left past on a kind of a somber sort of note. And we're going to see what happens when he finally gets to meet Christmas Present, who I always thought that Christmas Present 
it was a little bit more tame as far as a lot of the ghosts go, at least, you know, in the beginning. So we'll see what happens here in our next chapter. So here we're going to be reading chapter three, the second of the three spirits. Awaking in the middle of the night of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new specter would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands and lying down again established a sharp look out all around the bed for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort who plume themselves on being acquainted with the move or two and being usually equal to the time of day express the wide range of capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge har quite as heartily as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently when the bell struck one, and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All of this time he lay upon the bed, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, in which being only light was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant or what would be at and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be that very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person, not in the predicament, who knows what ought to have been done in it and would unquestionably have done it too at last. I say, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room from whence on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but the, it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many mirrors had been scattered there, and much a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as the, that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In ease stayed upon the couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high to shed its light on Scrooge, as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before this spirit. He was not the dog Scrooge he had been, and though his eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare as if disdaining to be warded off or concealed by any artifice. 
Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head wore no other covering than a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye and its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, its joyful air. Girded round its middle were an antique, was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheet was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the likes of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made to answer it. Have never walked forth with younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young. My elder brothers born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think so, said Scrooge. I am afraid I have not. Have you many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family, Scrooge said, to provide for. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkey, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pigs, pies, pudding, fruit, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of the night, and they stood upon the streets on Christmas morning, where the weather was severe. The people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses whence it was a mad delight to the boys to see it come plumbing down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roof and with the dirtier snow upon the ground which last deposit had been plowed up in the deep furrows of the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier parts descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by one consent caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad in the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then a facetious snowball, better nature, natured missile, far from mighty a word of jest, laughing heartily if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterer's shops were still half open and the fruitiers were radiant in their glory. There were great round potbelly baskets of chestnuts shaped like waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling in the streets and tumbling out into the streets of their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, brow-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like the Spanish friars, and winking their shelves in wanton sly sly slyness at the girls as they went by, and glancing demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from the conspicuous hooks from people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. And there were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings, ankle deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squad and squathy, setting off yellow and, and oranges and lemons in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urging, entreating, and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on, and to a fish went grasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers, nearly closed with perhaps two shutters down or one, but though those gaps such glimpses, 
it was not alone in the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks or even the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare the almonds so extremely white the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest lookers on feel faint and subsequently bileless. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or the French plums brushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that, the every, that everything was so good to eat in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day, they tumbled up against one another at the door, clashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humor possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that their polished hearts, with which they were fastened their aprons behind, might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection and for Christmas daws to peck if they so choose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes with their gayest faces. And at the time they were emerged from scores of by street lanes and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in the baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch, and it was a very uncommon kind of torch. For once or twice when there were angry words between some dinner carers who had jostled with one another, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly. For they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners and the progress of their cooking and the thawed blotch of wet above that each above each baker's oven where the pavement smoked as if stones were cooking too is there a peculiar flavor in which you sprinkle from your torch asked scrooge there is my own would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day asked scrooge to any kind given to a poor one most why to a poor one most asked scrooge because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge after a moment's thought, I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in the, that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and then went, they went on, invisible as they had been before, to the suburbs of town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully like that of a supernatural creature as was possible he could have done in a lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had known in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature and his spirit with all poor men that led them straight to Scrooge's clerk, for there he went and Scrooge took with him Holding to, uh, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of his of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed home. 
And then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Bob's wife, dressed but poorly in a twice turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and made a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the quarters of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced upon the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbled up, knocking loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha worn it as late last Christmas day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said the girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and shaking, taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. "'We'd a deal of work to finish up last night,' replied the girl, "'and had to clear away this morning, mother.' "'Well, never you mind, as long as you've come,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless ye.' "'No, no, there's father coming,' cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. "'Hide, Martha, hide!' So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob and father, down with him at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his thread threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. And tiny Tim upon his shoulder— Alas, for tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with sudden declension of his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, even if it were only a joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might have hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did Tiny Tim behave, asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor and came back. Tiny Tim, before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made any more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred round and round, and put it in the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought that the goose was the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth, it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a saucepan, sizz hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the, potato the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, Mars the dusted hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner, at the table, the two young Cratchits set chairs for everyone, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their post, crammed into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came, to be helped. At last, the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all around the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast, but when she did, and when a long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the young Cratchits, beat on the table with his handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There was never such a goose. 
Bob said he didn't believe that there ever was such a goose cooked. Its size and cheapness were the theme of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom upon the bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last, yet every one had enough. And the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of, sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a drill of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with the laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a freckled cannonball ball, so hard and firm, blazing in half, in half a quadrant of ignited brandy and bed, bed it, with Christmas holly stuck upon the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now that the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought that it was a small pudding for a large family. It would have been a he flat hearsay to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was done and the cloth cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up. The compound in the judge jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob called a circle, meaning half a one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, also two tumblers, a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug. However, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon the little stool. Bob held his withered little hand as if he loved the child and wished him to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant you have discovered, what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live and what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh God, to hear the insect on the life pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost rebuke and trembled to cast his eyes upon the ground, but he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, she said, and on which one drinks the health of such an odious, Stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the day, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him.
A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. After it passed away, they were ten, they were ten times merrier than before, and from the mere relief of Scrooge the baleful being done with, Bob Cratchit told him how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and six pence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire between his collars as if it, he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a mill milliner's, told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she worked at a stretch and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest tomorrow being a holiday. She passed at home. How long, also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high marks in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not a well-dressed family. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time and when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting. Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge's spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchen parlors and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparedness for a cozy dinner, with hot plates baking through as, and, and through the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out the cold and darkness. There, all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, aunts, uncles, and be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows of the window blind of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted and all chattering at once, tripping lightly off to some near neighbor's house, where woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches. Well, they knew it in a glow. But if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high. Blessing on it how the ghost exalted, how it bared its breath in its palm and floated out outpouring with a generous hand, its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplighter who ran on before dotted the dusky street with specks of light and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as spirit passed, though little kenned with lamplighter that he had company but Christmas. And now without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, and though it were the, as though it were the burial place of giants and water spread itself wheresoever as listed, or would have done so but for the frost that held it prisoner, and nothing grew but moss and frieze and coarse rank grass. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red, which glared upon the desolation for an instant, like a sullen eye and the frowning lower, lower, lower yet was lost in the thick gloom of the darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirit. But they know me. See? A light shone from the window at a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman and their children, and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon a barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very jolly old song when he was a boy, 
and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite bleat and loud, and so surely they stopped, his vigor sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robes, and passing upon the moor, sped with her not to see, to see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful rank of rocks behind him, and his ears were deafened by the thundering water as it rolled and rolled and raged among the dreadful caverns that had worn and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, some league or so beyond the shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of sea weed hung to its base, and storm birds, borne out the wind that might one might suppose it seaweed of the, of the water, rose and fell about it as the we waves they skimmed. But here two men watched the light they had the light had made a fire that threw the loophole in the thick stone wall out a ray of brightness on that awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other a merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather as the figurehead of the old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale itself. Again the ghost sped upon the black heaving sea, on and on until very far away, being far away, he told Scrooge from any shore they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the light out, the lookout on the bow, the officers who held the watch, dark ghostly figures on their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune or had a Christmas thought or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day with homeward hopes of belonging to it. And every man on board, walking or sleeping, good or bad, had a kinder word for another on that day than any day of the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, or had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great delight to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind and thinking of the solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness of an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Ha ha, laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha. If you should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man more blessed and laughed than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is I should like to know him too. Introduce me to him and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head and twisting his face in the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he and their assembled friends, being not behindhand, roared out lustily. Ha 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 ha! He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. More shame to him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, and as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes that you ever saw on any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, as I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, said Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do no good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking... <laughs> That, he, that he's ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill wills? Himself, always. Here he takes it in his head to dislike us and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. 
Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I am very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he had always, for he had answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Do go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh as if it were impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with the aromatic vinegar. His example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequences of him taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses ple pleasanter companions than he could find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If he only puts, if it only puts him in the vein to leave us his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of shaking Scrooge, but being thoroughly good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so as they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment, and they passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew that what they were about. When they sung a glee or a catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away at the bass like a good one, and never swell the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played some other tunes to a simple air, a mere nothing you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of his life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, which is a good game for children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! There was a first game at Blind Man's Bluff. Of course there was. And I no more believe that Topper was really blind than I believe that he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was done, a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, that the goat and the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over chairs, bumping against the piano, smoldering himself among the curtains, wherever she went, there he went. He always knew where the plump sister was, he wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a faint endeavor to seize you, which would have been a front to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But at last when he caught her, when in spite of her sulken rustlings and her rapid fluttering past him, he got her in the corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, um, his pretending that was necessary to touch her headdress and further assure himself that her identity of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger and a certain chain about her neck was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one for blind men's bluff party, but it was but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in the snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge stood behind her. But when she joined in the forfeits and loved her loved who admiration with the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and to the great joy of Scrooge's nephew beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge. 
for wholly forgetting in the interest in that he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears, that he sometimes came out with his guesses quite loud and very often guessed right too. For the sharpest needle, best Whitechapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it his, in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But this the spirit said could not be done. Here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something that the rest must find out what he only answering the questions yes or no as the case was the brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that what he was thinking of an animal a live animal a rather disagreeable animal a savage animal an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in london and walked about the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anybody and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in the market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear at every fresh question that was put to him this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter that was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp at last the plump sister falling into a similar state cried out I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge, which it certainly was. Admiration was a universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, is it a bear, ought to have been, yes, inasmuch as the answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. Here's a glass of mulled wine ready at our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless, Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge has had in perceptively become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an audible speech if the ghost had not given him some time. But the whole scene passed off the breath in the last words spoken by his nephew, and he had this in the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope by poverty, it, and it was rich in almshouses, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where ev vain man, in his little brief authority, had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night. But Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into a space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left a children's twelfth night party. When he looked at the spirit as they stood together in an open space, he noticed that, it, that its gray hair was gray. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, asked Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I'm not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, intent, looking intently at the spirit's robes. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh, man, look here, look here, down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with the freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand 
like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds where angels might have sat and throned devils lurked and glared out menacing no change no degradation no perversion of humanity in any grade through all the mysteries of wonderful creation has monsters half so horrible and dread scrooge stared back appalled having them shown to him like this in this way he tried to say that they were fine children but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude spirit are they yours scrooge could say no more they are man's said the spirit looking down upon him and they cling to me appealing from their fathers this boy is ignorance this girl is want beware them both and all their decree but most of all beware this boy for on his brow i see that written which is doom unless that writing be erased deny it cried the spirit stretching out its hand towards the city slander those who tell it ye admit it for your facetious purposes and make it worse and bid the end are there no prisons said the spirit turning to him for the last time with his own words are there no workhouses the bell struck twelve scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not as the last stroke ceased to vibrate he remembered the prediction of old jacob marley and lifting up his eyes beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. And that is our chapter. Thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. And in our next video, we're going to meet the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Have a good night, everyone.